Thank you. Thank you for attending my talk, What's Your Problem? Um, my name is uh, Asper Nursberg. I'm a developer experience architect in Swedbank Pay and PayX. And let's just dive right into the deep end. Errors are hard. Uh, let's have a look at a few examples of how errors may end up <clears throat> if you don't think hard about their design before you launch your API. In this example by Michael Timms, uh, all errors return 200 OK because of some Flask middleware acting up. And Ethan got a try again later with a 200 OK and an empty response body uh, if the API was overloaded. Peter had an API default to 400 for all errors due to a customer complaint. Matt Bishop has experienced that Flash only supports 200 OK, and this is a common problem across many HTTP client libraries that they only support this status code, which makes it hard or even impossible to use status code correctly. And in this example by Vattum, uh, unintentional um, messages can have unintentional consequences. In, in this example, it actually helped him fix the problem, but oftentimes some problems like this introduce security risks in your API, so don't do that. Designer and Geek has experience with an API that reports failure for successful requests, which is a bit odd, and here's three tweets that again show the problem of not uh, caring about the HTTP status code at all. And lastly, here's an example of Unix developers perhaps not being intimately familiar with HTTP status codes. So I think those examples, and there's many more, uh, illustrate just how hard proper error handling in an API can be. Uh, to get a better grip of how you can treat your errors in an, uh, your application, uh, here's a tip on how to categorize them. If we take a look at a regular request coming from a client into an API and then to a backend third-party service, any number of things can go wrong in this request and response chain. But just to make it simple, we can divide this in two and say that Everything happening on the uh, left-hand side of the, of the diagram uh, is a 400 error, and everything on the right-hand side is a 500 error. The problem is, how do you draw the line inside your API? When do you resolve to 400, and when do you resort to 500? So let's zoom in on that problem. If we take a deeper look at how that request might be handled, uh, in a regular MVC framework, you usually uh, receive the request by a controller, perform some validation, and then you map it into a core domain object. If anything goes wrong uh, up until the, the instance you have that core domain model instantiated in memory, it's a clear 400 error. But once you have that core domain object instantiated in memory, anything that goes wrong from that point on is a 500 error. And if we take a look at how that might be implemented, here's just a random uh, controller action method with some pseudocode. We can see we have two lines of code that perform validation and mapping. And if those two lines of code fail, it's a 400 error. And if the rest of the code fails, it's a 500 error. So that's kind of a simple way to, to how to categorize errors in, in your code base. Uh, but how do you implement this in practice, and how do you treat these exceptions uh, and um, uh, translate them to HTTP? Uh, let's have a, another look at this drawing. Uh, in the center of our application, I would say it's the best practice to have a core. The core represents our domain model, and in that domain model, we have our business logic. Uh, 
And this core makes sure that all data, no matter where it comes from, complies with our business rules. Around this core, we have a layer of infrastructure. Um, and this is overly simplified, but for the purpose of this talk, I think this is enough to get the right idea. The infrastructure layer knows about how to produce JSON, how to consume JSON, how to produce HTML, how to place messages on message buses, how to talk to database, how to talk to SOAP, web service, and so on. In, the, in domain driven design lingo, inside the core, though, uh, you only have ports and domain models. And these ports, also known as interfaces, in languages such as C Sharp and Java, they are implemented in the outer layer, the infrastructure layer, as adapters or implementations of these interfaces or ports. So the core knows nothing about the infrastructure layer. Whether the core is used by a web application, uh, a console application, a mobile app, or whatever, doesn't really matter. The same business rules should apply regardless of which context the core is used in. This means that the dependency direction is inwards and never outwards. The core basically has no external dependencies. So whether a repository add method defined in the core is implemented as an HTTP request or as a database commit doesn't really matter to the core itself. And since the core has no knowledge of HTTP, it can't throw an HTTP status code. It needs to throw regular uh, exceptions that make sense for the domain model. Uh, exceptions should make sense to the business rules that they are built to solve, not to the specifics of the infrastructure they are presented in, in the end. As the exceptions propagate from the core into the infrastructure of the layer of the application, they can then be caught in, in the infrastructure and be wrapped inside infrastructure-specific exceptions that add contextual information that makes sense in the given context. So if you go back to our response, uh, sorry, our um, controller method, and take a uh, look at what happens inside the validate method, uh, it's pretty simple. You just perform the validation of whatever validation framework you, you, you're using, and you catch that and throw it as a request exception or whatever exception you want to capture for 400 category errors. So now we have a sort of idea how to throw exceptions in our code base, but what about catching and translating into HTTP? Well, for that, we need an, a global exception handler. And the idea here is just that you have a handler that for every uncaught exception in your application, this method gets invoked. And the idea here is to, to capture the exception, do some translation logic on it, and then produce an HTTP result. And I've done that with a problem class. You might ask what this problem class is. And uh, it's an implementation of RFC 7807 problem details for HTTP APIs. And it has its own content type. It's commonly known as problem JSON. And unless you're in the business of producing error description formats, I suggest you don't reinvent the wheel. Use, use this standard for all your errors. This is how it looks like, basic JSON structure. You start out with the status code. That's just a repetition of what's in the HTTP header. And then you have a type. That's a string identifier that, ident that can increase the semantics over the status code. So if the status code is not enough to convey the semantics of this error, you use the type. And you can see it's a URI, but it, it's basically just an identifier. Uh, 
it's possible to make it so that you can visit this URI and provide documentation. If you want to do that, I recommend that you have this URI inside your application or your API code so it's stable, and then redirect to documentation instead because documentation URIs are known to change. And since this is a programmatic identifier, you want it stable. And then you have a title that just human readable description of the problem. And the detail, you want to enable the consumer of the API to, to actually recover from the problem occurred, so they are able to help themselves. And in instance, you identify this instance of the problem, so you are able to, to correlate perhaps an incoming support request with an error you have logged in, in a log file, so you can fix a specific customer's problem. And then you have some extension properties you can add. You can add as many as you want, as long as they don't collide with the ones defined by the standard. And I would recommend you add some, some that explain to the consumer which fields in the incoming request were invalid and why. So if we go back to our exception handler and take a peek at how the problem implementation might look like. This is a very short example, but we default to 500 as our status code with a generic type and title. And then for each exception we handle in our code base, we will add clauses like this that uh, refine the error message, the type, the title, the details, and everything. And when we then want to produce the HTTP response, based from this data, we just serialize this object, basically, into JSON with the correct content type, status code, and so on. But let's take a bit more uh, look at status, because there, there's a plethora of status codes. And the problem with many of them is that they don't really apply to your application. Even though HTTP is, is an application protocol, they often uh, apply only to HTTP itself. And that m makes many people uh, confused, such as the 406 not acceptable um, status code. Sounds like it can be used for anything that is not acceptable, but no, you can't. It's actually only for requests that has an accept header. And if the request does not have an accept header, this is not a suitable status code. The same for 417, expectation failed. It's not some generic ex expectation, I don't like you or whatever, I thought you would be nice. No, it's for the expect header. And if the request did not have an expect header, this is not a suitable status code. And lastly, for 428, precondition required. It's not any generic precondition. It's actually for very specific headers that are missing in the request, uh, such as if match or if unmodified since, that you can use to avoid lost updates. Uh, so this is just a concurrency protection built into the, to the uh, protocol that you can use. So. That concludes how we map from exceptions to HTTP. But how, we, how about the other way around, from, from problem JSON received by a client and into some sort of exception or problem inside the client code base? If you take a look at a request coming from, um, to a server and then turning into a response to the client, we of course need to check the status. If it's 200, we just present the data. If it's 300, we perform the redirect and redo the whole sequence. Uh, if it's a 400, we can map that into a request exception, 500, server exception, and so on. It's pretty much the same as we would do in the server. So for each different 400 type of status code we receive, we just map it into a different type of exception that is thrown then in the client code base. So we get all these uh, exception types that all inherit from the same base exception representing the 400 category of status codes. 
And we get the same thing for the servers, uh, the 500 category of status codes. And <clears throat> if we look back at the problem, Jason, if the status code is not sufficiently uh, informational, you turn to the type to, to better figure out what the exact problem was and how you can recover from it programmatically in, in the client. And when that's not enough, use the human readable data inside the problem, JSON structure, because it's important to remember what we're ultimately after here and that is providing the end user with good error messages that he or she can act upon to correct the request. And that end user might be, might be a novice uh, per performing a task in a web UI, or it can be a developer integrating against your API. Either way, I think the error message should be so chock full of information that they are self-serviced and, and can fix the problem themselves. So let's summarize. Error messages initiate a dialogue with the receiver. Make sure that dialogue is constructive. And enable the receiver to be self-serviced so he or she can discover problems and recover from them themselves. Throw regular exceptions in, uh, in the core without any HTTP knowledge and in a way that makes sense for the domain and business rules. Use existing exceptions if they are available, but don't be afraid to create your own. Add context to exceptions you throw, such as user ID, request URL, correlation ID, session ID, and so on. And if you catch other exceptions, add the same uh, contextual data to those exceptions and rethrow them or wrap them in your custom exceptions that are already enriched with this contextual data. And then translate these exceptions into problem JSON at the latest possible moment to get a rich stack trace, which makes logging uh, and digging through logs and debugging uh, problems much easier. And in the client, translate the received problem JSON into an exception and throw it. And if your client is an API itself, since when we perform an HTTP request, we're already in the infrastructure layer of the application, we can interpret the problem JSON, enrich it, uh, in the ex exception, and then we can almost act like a proxy for other problem JSON we receive. So we can preserve all that information all the way up to when we are responding to our incoming request. And lastly, these are some words and Slack URLs I recommend you explore after this talk. And Please don't be afraid to reach out on Twitter, Slack, physically, whatever, and probe me with any questions or comments you have. Thank you. <laughs>